Okay, good Friday morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to season two, episode 20 of the Backyard Naturalist. My name is Tim from the Urban Ecology Center here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And today we are talking about the domestic dog in what I will admit maybe my worst movie takeoff in Pile of Dogs uh, from the original Isle of Dogs, which is a fantastic movie, by the way. Uh, I just spent a week out on Chambers Island in Green Bay with a pack of five free roaming dogs and 12 free roaming humans. So I was immersed in star power subjects for this talk. Um, also need to apologize. We're still having difficulty with embedded videos. So we'll run through the talk and then we'll look at some videos at the end. For those of you that are watching this recorded, please email me and I'm happy to send you a link to those videos. And as always, before I get started, I would like to remind everyone that the Backyard Naturalist is part of the UEC In My Backyard, and I encourage you to subscribe to the Urban Ecology Podcast. The next three episodes are a series looking at community science, and thanks again to all of the subscribers to this series. I really appreciate your support. Also, happy summer, everyone. Uh, the, summer, uh, the summer solstice occurs this year on Sunday, June 20th at 10.31 p.m., this marks the longest day for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere and the beginning of astronomical summer. Although if you're more of a believer in meteorological, meteorological summer, that started on June 1st, which means we're 18 days into summer meteorologically, but astronomically, it's still spring. And I guess there's a, a third official start of summer. Uh, if those, those of you who believe in Memorial Day as the start, then we are also into summer the Memorial Day to Labor Day uh, period. So anyway, but happy Memorial Day. We had both a lunar and a solar eclipse recently, uh, at least here in Milwaukee. We celebrated Visak, which is a, Buddha, a Buddhist festival commemorating the birth, enlightenment, and death of Buddha. Uh, June 11th was King Kamehameha Day in Hawaii, honoring the person who established the unified kingdom of Hawaii. And uh, I'd like to wish you all a happy Juneteenth Day, which is tomorrow, June 19th, uh, and is now a federal holiday uh, commemorating the end of slavery in the United States, also known as Emancipation Day, Freedom Day, and the country's second Independence Day. So the feature presentation, the domestic dog, Canis familiaris. Uh, I would like to dedicate this show to all of the dogs who have shared their unconditional love with me if even for a few hours, because with dogs, it seems there is no other way to love. So I'd like to raise a toast to some of the best dogs I've known. I encourage you to do the same. In my case, uh, my toast is to Schnee, Bear, Whiskey, Pepper, George, Cody, Tina, Lucy, Woody, and a special toast to the island dogs I've known, Zuzu, Ellie, Poe, Winnie, Molly, Beowulf, Snug, Bowie, Xiaobai, Banjo, and all the other dogs. Uh, that have stolen my heart and often my food. To start with, dogs are in the family Canidae, or the Canids. And in season one, episode eight, All Coyote on the Western Front, I go into more detail on what makes a uh, Canid a Canid. Uh, but to sum up, Canids are mammalian vertebrate animals in the order Carnivora, or the Carnivores. Not all members of the Carnivores Carnivora are carnivores. So the raccoon is an omnivore and the giant panda is strictly vegetarian, but they're all in the carnivore grouping. And the two biggest groups of carnivores are the cat-like carnivores or the filiform mia, um, which includes cats and the hyena. I always never know where to put the hyena between cats and dogs and it has gone back and forth, but, but they're strictly with the cats right now. And then you have the dog-like carnivores or the caniformia, which includes dogs, but also includes bears and seals. And in that episode, we also look at how canids spread across the world uh, from the ancestral canid in the Western United States to now include the wild dogs in Africa, the dingoes in Australia and others. And if we get down to the genus canis, we will have already separated from the foxes, the vulpes, um, and many of the, the jackals and a lot of extinct uh, canids, including the dire wolf, which was real, the largest wolf or largest canid ever to live. 
There are six extant or living species in the genus Canis. There's the golden jackal of Southern Asia, the coyote of North America, the African golden wolf of Northern Africa, the Ethiopian wolf, which is one of the rarest wild dogs, uh, and then the iconic and widespread gray wolf, and then of course our domestic dog, Canis familiaris. According to Ologies with Ali Ward, the study of dogs is technically called sinology, which has roots in Greek, where sinos is the word for dog, although sinologists are usually uh, used in reference to dog handlers and trainers rather than dog scientists. And while I'm at it, I'll also give a shout out to one of my other favorite references for this episode, the How Stuff Works Empire. It's not a secret to anybody that dogs come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, yet they are all the same species. Any breed could technically breed with any other breed, although the, the, the size differences uh, would lead to some obvious complications. Um, and although this is also true with other domesticated animals, uh, cats, pigeons, and rabbits, there's a lot of different breeds. It really seems like dogs are at the extreme for a single species. So um the 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 canis genus is also known as the wolf like canids actually hang on one second here we go um so this is that's that slide of the different species of canids in the in the canis genus again the wolf like canids um if you add in a few additional dog like animals the foxes and the south american canids uh, which includes the crab-eating fox and the maned wolf. It's easy to, to look at this and see why some scientists, including Charles Darwin, believe that different breeds of dogs evolved from different wild dog species, um, which gave birth to that wide variety of dog breeds we have today. And let me go back to this slide. Um, but DNA evidence supports that all breeds of dogs from the Great Dane to the Chihuahua to the Poodle, uh, all came from the wolf branch of the dog family tree. They didn't evolve from different species of wild dogs. They all came from the wolf branch and that branched out from an ancestral wolf breed about a hundred thousand years ago. And there is this kind of common misconception that dogs evolved from the modern wolf, the gray wolf, but that's not the case. A better way to look at it is that both dogs and gray wolves evolved from a common ancestor that was probably wolf-like. And then both dogs and wolves have been evolving in the ensuing 100,000 years. So dogs and wolves are like distant cousins, uh, but they're more, more closely related to each other than either of them are related to coyotes and foxes, if that makes sense. It's like humans didn't evolve from chimpanzees and chimpanzees didn't evolve from humans humans and chimpanzees evolved from a common ancestor uh, that looked neither like humans or chimpanzees. So it's kind of crazy to think that at some point in history, there was a mother wolf-like creature that could have looked like this and they had a litter of pups. And then one of those pups gave rise to what would become the dog group uh, like this Siberian Husky. And another pup gave rise to what would become the gray wolf. And uh, these distant cousins share a lot of DNA and still can produce hybrid offspring. Uh, but again, it's, it's more accurate to think of them as cousins than to say that one descended from the other. All right, so there are also a lot of theories about how dogs became domesticated, uh, but it's very likely that the process began 15,000 years ago, which likely makes dogs the first domesticated species. Uh, it's about 5,000 years before cats and cows and other things became domesticated. So probably the first domesticated animal. Um, some think that humans kind of took wild wolves out of the wild and turned them into pets. Uh, that's kind of an easy way to think about it. But the most likely and the leading theory is that dogs kind of domesticated themselves as an adaptation, as a way to survive, as a way to thrive. And if you think about it like that, um, that dog branch of the wild wolf family tree is doing much more successful or is much more successful than the wolf branch um, because dogs are 
everywhere and in in huge numbers um so as as human villages formed this this new niche niche developed for a lot of scavenging animals so we see it with rats and house sparrows and raccoons and other animals that kind of really took advantage of the human habitation um and a lot of it had to do with um food scraps and garbage so it's mainly food there are other advantages but it was mainly food scraps and garbage as a new uh food niche for a lot of animals and so in the case of wolves natural selection would favor the wolves that were the boldest that would enter the village and face this potential interaction with humans and in addition to favoring the boldest wolves natural selection would also favor the smaller wolves because uh smaller wolves don't need as much food to survive and they might be a less of a threat to the humans so large body size is great for taking down a moose but if your food is coming from a village uh, a larger body size just means you have to eat more and if you're eating off of food scraps uh you don't have to necessarily hunt down and 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 kill your prey so wolves that were smaller and bolder and more tolerant to this new species are were favored uh through natural selection and we see this difference when you look at um the differences between dogs dog puppies and wolf puppies so a wolf pup starts to become suspicious of unfamiliar things at about the age of 19 days so things that uh a wolf pup is exposed to during the first 19 days of life are things that they start they usually tolerate but then after you know starting from day 20 on anything that's new a creature or an individual or an object uh is start to is is met with extreme suspicion and there's an advantage to that uh and this remains true in wolves even after generations of domestic breeding they still are very wary of new things after the first few weeks of life a domestic dog pup on the other hand uh they don't start to become suspicious of new things until about 4 months of life so there's this much longer period of growing accustomed to your environment um and so we were talking a little bit about thunder before the show uh how some dogs tolerate thunder better than others uh cats some dogs tolerate cats better than others uh it's usually the case that if the dog is exposed to these things it's for a little more common during that first 4 months of life which is a much longer period uh then they're much less afraid of it as an adult and um so if you if you have a puppy and you're considering also having a cat it's a good idea to get that puppy to exposed to cats early in their life um which brings us to our first myth buster uh that you can't teach an old dog new tricks this is not true older dogs can learn new tricks they can learn new environments they can learn to hang with new members of the pack uh, it just takes them a little longer the process is a little slower so you can acclimate an older dog to a cat it just takes a lot more work and a lot more patience so again if you're raising a dog and there're things you know they're going to be exposed to um try to expose them early on in that period if you have that opportunity you don't always have that so if we go back to the domestication of dogs In the 1950s, a Russian scientist, Dmitry Belyaev, undertook an ambitious breeding experiment with wild foxes. Um and he specifically picked foxes because they're less related to dogs, but he was studying the processes of dog domestication um to see if it would help answer some questions. And so he captured a large group of wild foxes uh and he started to rank them based on their tameness and their aggressiveness and he essentially created two lines of foxes one line that was very aggressive towards humans and then one that was much more tolerant more submissive and even friendlier towards humans and he found that the friendliest foxes uh started to develop many different color coats and he later found that the genes that are linked to friendliness in dogs are also linked to multicolored coats. So this makes sense now if you're starting to think about dogs and the friendliest wolves uh becoming more accustomed to humans that 
those genes are also linked to variations in color coats, which helps with uh, kind of get to so many different breeds of dogs and different forms. And so uh, it's not just the color coat that that friendliness is linked to. Um, there are other traits like floppy ears and shorter snouts that are linked to those friendly genes. And so you kind of get this, this package that if you are going to start to breed the friendliest dogs or wolves, I, I should say, if you're breeding the friendliest wolves or foxes, you start to get these traits that we see in our modern dogs. And speaking of floppy ears, there is no natural advantages, no natural advantage to floppy ears. Uh, in fact, really other than the elephant, um, there are no natural animals with floppy ears. There's probably a couple I'm missing, um, but, the, but you do find floppy ears in the ones that we've domesticated. And um, we'll take a, a little look at that in a video at the end. But the key point here is that now these wolves that are turning into dogs are becoming smaller, they're becoming friendlier, and they're becoming more colorful. And then it makes sense that humans start to notice this variation, and eventually the humans start to see some favorites and they these the preferences. And then from natural selection, it goes to artificial selection, where humans start to breed dogs that have desirable traits to them. And then that leads to the 300 plus breeds of dogs recognized today, like closer to 350. Um, and that really, in a nutshell, is the leading theory on dog domestication. Uh, and what's really cool is that the process is still continuing today. Dogs still live on the margins of societies around the world, wild dogs, and they're still feeding on the scraps and kind of living the life of that old proto dog, that, that ancient dog. And there still is selection for friendliness among the wild, the, the kind of feral dogs. There still is that selection for less aggressive, smaller size, uh, floppy ears, and that accompanying variation that might lead a human to take in a feral dog. And so the evolution of dog breeds continues today and likely has been going on since the original proto dog uh, ventured into human settlements. So that's, that's pretty cool to think that that selection is still happening today and new breeds will likely come of it. Um, so in this particular story, we saw how natural selection started the process and then humans took over and used artificial selection to create the different breeds. Uh, but this also led to some major problems. If you maintain a purebred breed of dog for generations, you, you can quickly lose the variation in the population. And variation in, in genes is an important factor in evolution and fitness. Uh, and so if you're, if you're not careful, you start to lose, as you lose that genetic variation, you also start to lose the protection from, from some diseases, diseases uh, and recessive genes become more prominent, and um, that can be a, a real hindrance to the dog's health. So it's something you really need to think about within a, a line of dog breed, just as you think about it when you're trying to save a wild animal or a, an, an endangered animal, that the genetic variation loss is really important. So an example, the French Bulldog, which is one of the most popular breed of dogs, um, if you have a purebred, those potential issues begin at birth because now most uh, French bulldogs, when they're born, they have to be born through cesarean section because that head is just too big for, uh, for the mother to give natural birth. Um, and then the problems often don't end there. Uh, you'll, you'll probably be dealing with other things throughout the life. It's not a guarantee. It's just the probability is higher. Um, so just, you know, something to consider. When you're, when you're picking out a dog. Another very popular dog uh, that also deals with uh, inbreeding issues is the German Shepherd. Um, so loss of genetic variation le leads to many of the purebred lines dealing with hip dysplasia. Almost every German Shepherd uh, deals with that throughout and, and other things throughout their life. So mixed breeds, on the other hand, tend to be much healthier uh, from a physical and genetic standpoint. Uh, so again, something to consider when choosing a pet, I would, I would strongly recommend uh, looking at shelters and rescues for your companions um, uh, for, for many reasons, but again, even just from the health of the animal. So now that humans are selecting these desirable traits and creating these breeds, we 
we also are, are likely understanding that having a dog around is is more valuable than than them just eating our trash and performing that service for us. So dogs bark at intruders entering our space and um, they evolved to become they, they were already extremely efficient hunters. Uh, and, you know, the, the wolves and, and evolution in general doesn't necessarily work in a vac. It doesn't work in a vacuum. So natural selection can only work on what's already there and change it. So it's why whales still have hands and feet, why we still have a tailbone, uh, why our mammalian eye design isn't that good from an engineering perspective. Um, so you have this evolution. We're trying to get these traits out of the dogs, but we still have this basic dog package we have to work with. And um, so the dogs that evolved from this wolf ancestor, um, there's a Ray and Lorna Coppinger, our, our dog behavioralist, that kind of broke down the wolf hunting process into seven distinct steps. So this is again is from the ancestral wolf, uh, well, the ancestral dog, um, and a lot of those uh, genes that are continuing in the dogs and the wolves. So first, when a wolf hunts, uh, they orient themselves towards the prey. Then they focus intently on the prey with, uh, with their eyes and they kind of slink and get ready for the chase. And if they reach their intended prey, there are three distinct types of bites that happen next. First is the grab bite, then the kill bite, and then the dissect and eat bite. Um, these are also, by the way, examples of fixed action patterns, which uh, essentially is something that once you start, it's almost impossible to stop. And the best example that we can relate to is the yawn. So if you're yawning, just try to stop a yawn in the middle of the process and you'll know what I'm talking about. So these are fixed action patterns that, you know, once you kind of start it, it's really hard for a dog to stop it because the neurons are firing. Um, and, but this is what we had to work with. So I was talking about how natural selection works and what you've already got. So this is kind of the, the, the way that wolves kill. And then we took parts of this and, and accentuated the things that we wanted into dog species. So humans are also hunters, right? And we're really good at hunting. Um, wolves are really good hunters. And then if you combine wolves or dogs and humans, then you get a really, really effective kind of hunting team. And so a lot of the breeds came from that aspect of humans hunting and then dogs uh, kind of uh, recruiting dogs to help them. So if we break down these seven steps uh, into kind of dog, dog trainers will like to look at this, but, but really we're gonna focus uh, on how these steps led to certain breeds of dogs. So if you start with orientation, the first step in a wolf kill, uh, and the obvious example here is the pointer, uh, not only are they excellent at pinpointing prey, they've also learned to exaggerate that orientation so that the human hunter can also know where the prey is located. So they don't have to do that, but they've accentuated the things to let the hunters know that they pinpointed the animal. So orient is also associated with searching. So you'll see that if you hide a treat for your dog and your dog is reaching back into their predatory instincts to try to find their food. That's the first thing. And that's kind of orientation and searching. They're using their sharp senses of smell and hearing. And uh, this is true in both dogs and wolves. The next step, I'll do two and three here, is the eye and the stalk. That, and sometimes they're combined as the eye stalk. And this is that intense stare that comes out once they found their prey and that kind of slinking down in anticipation and chase. So we see that in wild animals like the cheetah and lions and wolves. And we've also selected these behaviors uh, for dog breeds, most notably and famously in the border collie. So if you've met a border collie and you can understand that intensity, uh, we bred border collies to be herders, not hunters. So we need them to excel at these two steps, eye and stock, but we also need to turn off everything that comes after that, because we don't necessarily want them to chase, catch, grab, and bite, and potentially kill the animals they're hurting. 
we just bred them for these two particular uh, traits, and that's what they're really good at. So as pets, you, 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 you hear stories of border collies that have such a strong herding instinct uh, bred into them that they will herd whatever's around, kids, cats. Uh, there's an Australian shepherd that kept trying to herd pine cones, which I, I think I could even do that. But again, this is one of the reasons why border collies may not be the best option as pets for certain households, but they excel at these two aspects of the wolf hunting. Then we move on to step four, and that's the chase. And that's best exemplified in dogs by the hounds. So the greyhounds with their speed and the bloodhounds with their sense of smell, uh, doing what a wolf does well, but the dogs in these cases do better at the chase than the wolf does. Greyhounds are much faster than wolves and bloodhounds have a much better sense of smell than wolves. Um, and like with the border collie, if you were using dogs in a hunting uh, example, it's just an important to train them not to continue with the kill. They just need to chase the animal and subdue it. And I'm bringing the word training in here because if, if you get into the nurture versus nature debate, uh, there are the genetics in the animal and then there's the learning environment. So in both the dogs and the wolves, it's in the genes, but then they also need to learn either from their pack mates, uh, whether that's human or uh, or wolf or dog. Step five is the grab. And there's no better grabber, at least in the dog world, than the retrievers who have the soft mouths. Because uh, again, we don't want them to bite, we just want them to grab. And um, a wolf in this case is usually grabbing an animal that it's pursuing. Uh, so it's, it's grab bite is going to be much stronger than a retriever grab bite. Uh, it, it may immediately lead to a kill, but but first they need to bring down the animal, especially if it's a larger animal uh, and there may be help coming soon. So the grab bite is different from the kill bite. Um, and, and this is where I can tell you from firsthand experience that the retrieving part needs to be trained because my retriever banjo will in fact uh, search for and grab a ball or a stick that you throw, but that's where he stops. He will then keep it for himself and turn it into a game of chase, uh, me chasing him. So he doesn't really retrieve, he just Treves. Um, then there is the kill bite. And because it's it's not a lot of fun to look at a picture of an animal killing another animal, I've substituted this photo of a wolf bringing down a watermelon. But there are instances where humans do want dogs to chase and kill animals. And the best example of that is the rat terrier. Uh, oops. That um, we want them to perform all these steps to get rid of mice and rats. Um, and uh, we, we usually don't want them to do to eat the rats that they catch too. So they'll they'll perform steps one through five or through six pretty well. And uh, the the kill bite is usually at the throat of a larger animal, um, or it's the kind of bite and shake that a terrier would do with a rat or a mouse if it's a smaller animal. Um, and we see dogs do that little bite and shake uh, quite often with toys. And then the last step is the bite to dissect. And it's something um, that wolves often need to do to break down larger prey into bite-sized chunks. And most dogs uh, do that well on their own. They don't need help. They do practice on chew toys uh, and their dinner, and particularly when they attack rawhide. And I say that knowing that rawhide is potentially not the best thing for your dogs to chew on. And I'm not a veter veterinarian, so um, please check with your trusted health professional for your dog um, if you are concerned. So again, Wolves do these eight steps together better than any dog, but dogs will often outperform wolves at the specific tasks uh, for which they've been bred. So that, that short tour explains some breeds of dogs, particularly those related to hunting, uh, but there are about 350 recognized breeds and some of these were bred for behaviors uh, not associated with hunting. So we have bred some dogs to be lap dogs to be our companion, to snuggle, to keep us company. Um, and, and those are usually smaller dogs, although size can be relative when, when we're talking about a lap dog and the snuggling instinct can be strong. And somebody could try to tell some of the bigger dogs they aren't lap dogs, but that usually doesn't work. Dalmatians were, bed to, were bred to be uh, extremely active, running along fire coaches 
both to clear the way for the horses from from a crowd and then also to guard the fire trucks to guard the scene so they're essentially guard dogs that are very very active and so it's one of the reason that as pets they don't necessarily work very well in a lot of households uh, because they are guard dogs and they can be aggressive and uh, because they really need that energy and that activity so um, that's often not the best choice for for a house if you can't provide it with them or if you have small kids rottweilers are kind of like the older tougher cousins to to shepherds and border colliers oh, excuse me border collie collies um, they also herd whereas border collies herd sheep um, rottweilers herd things that are much bigger so the dogs themselves have to be much bigger and they were really bred to muscle cows along the road to the market. And then on the other end of the herding spectrum, Yorkshire Terriers were actually bred to herd geese. So uh, you have several of these dogs that aren't necessarily hunting, but they're herding. Dachshunds or wiener dogs uh, were bred to hunt in badger holes where long legs might just get in the way. And poodles, believe it or not, were originally bred as hunting dogs, uh, known as bog dogs, because uh, their hair can withstand those wet, muddy conditions of the wetlands. Then there are the, um, the traits that we like to, that we look for to show off beauty and, and kind of that aesthetic sense. And so we could also use the poodle for this example, but we'll look at the Cocker Spaniel. So like the poodle, Cocker Spaniels were originally bred as hunting dogs and retrievers. Uh, they can maneuver through thick brush, little spaces to retrieve an animal. Um, but this Cocker Spaniel and this poodle, uh, for that matter, would, would, would make a pretty terrible hunting dog, but they're the same breed. So if for these dogs, their hair would be caught in the brambles and become matted and, and pretty disgusting. And this is a good example of how within breeds uh, you have lines cultivated for functions like hunting or herding and you have lines that are uh, bred for aesthetic beauty and so many breeds like the poodle and the cocker spaniel uh, diverge they have divergent lines where one is is the fun the, the the hunting side and one is the show dog side and so then you have show dogs creating another uh, element of breeds and breeding, uh, artificial breeding for certain characteristics. And I'll just go through these next few slides silently uh, because I don't think commentary is needed. And I promise you, I'm showing you this without judgment. And congratulations to Wasabi the Pekingese that took best in show this year at what the Westminster dog show. So in addition to dog breeds, we start to see some designer mixes like the Labradoodle, which combines the friendliness of a golden retriever with the low shedding hair of a poodle, the low maintenance hair of a poodle. You have the Chihuini, which combines the intelligence of a Chihuahua with the spirited nature of a Dachshund, the wiener dog, which is why you get the Chihuini. You have a Shorky, combining a Shih Tzu with a Yorkshire Terrier and a Pomsky, the combination of a Husky and a Pomeranian. Um, and when you get down to it, like it or not, uh, we call them our best friend and there are many reasons why. They serve a lot of other purposes in our life. So they help us find and help people as search and rescue dogs. There are many kinds of service dogs, therapy dogs, emotional support dogs that aid and comfort us. Emotional support dogs tend to not require training. They just are themselves, whereas service dogs often require training and certification. And um, they also can be extremely attuned to human behavior, both behaviorally and chemically. So the average human has 5 million scent receptors in our nose. That's, that's a lot, 5 million. Uh, the bloodhound has 300 million scent receptors. And you know, one, 
one thing to look for when you look at a skull of an animal is that a longer nose usually is associated with better scent. So if you have a short pug nose, uh, they're, they're not probably not as good as smelling as dogs with that kind of long elongated uh, nasal cavity. So with those 300 million scent receptors, um, most dogs are extremely sensitive to scent. They can smell things 30 or 40 feet underground, uh, which is why they're used to sniff out explosives and contraband. And they also likely use their sense of smell to detect chemical changes in our bodies. So they can detect cancer at an early stage. Uh, they can detect and warn a person prone to seizures that an episode is forthcoming. Um, they can detect mood swings, probably because of the chemical changes happening in our body. They can detect diabetes and blood sugar. Uh, and now they're used as one of the most reliable methods to detect coronavirus. Uh, so if you wanna have a, a gathering that's safer, um, some places are starting to use uh, coronavirus sniffing dogs. Dogs are better than even chimpanzees at following a human gaze, which really starts to show the depth of the connection between dogs and humans. Uh, one of the reasons that humans, so if you look at a, a great ape, a chimpanzee, their eyes are all dark. Uh, but one of the reasons that humans have sclera, which is the whites in our eyes, is, is so that we can communicate, use our eyes in communication. And sometimes that's about protecting yourself. So uh, it's, it's one of those more honest forms of communication. Uh, so other humans can tell if we are averting our gaze, if we're acting shifty. Um, often because it's harder to falsely communicate all your feelings without giving something up. Um, so dogs have evolved to pick up on this human trait. And, and like I said, they can, they can follow a human gaze better than just about any other animal, including the chimpanzees. Um, and they use it to their and our advantage. Um, although at least with my dogs, it's probably just to help them find the food that you put on the floor for them. But they, uh, they've really taken advantage of humans and our communication and kind of tapped into that. And although I'm not a dog trainer, um, I have heard kind of that criticism of the, the training as the alpha dog and the dominance hierarchy. Uh, and, and again, I'll leave that to you to decide. Um, but there is evidence that even in wild wolf packs, that alpha dog and that whole hierarchy is not as tight as we have been led to believe over the years. There's new evidence showing that even in wild wolf packs, there's, there's much more nuances and variation to that kind of alpha pack dominant strategy. Um, so again, I'm not here to judge how you train your dog or the boundaries you set individually for your dogs, uh, but there is a lot of evidence kind of showing some, some maybe deeper complexities to that. You are the alpha in your house. Um, but regardless of that, there's one thing that is quite certain that petting a dog lowers stress and anxiety in both you and the dog. Uh, so the absence of companionship can cause harm to both people and dogs. And it is a healthy thing for both you and a dog if you love it and pet it. Petting an animal releases oxytocin. So whether it's your dog or your cat or someone else's dog or cat or rabbit, uh, your health can be improved by loving an animal because we all have the best dog in the world. So I'm gonna end this portion of it and, and uh, stop sharing my screen and bring up uh, just a few videos I found. Um, all right, so now I have to share my screen in a different way. That's not it. Here we go. Let's try again. Oh, I think I know what you need to do here. There we go. Okay. Anyone wants to tell a joke while I'm figuring this out, feel free. Okay, share screen. There we go. All right, so I, to me, the Rottweiler herding the cattle is kind of new to me. 
So I found a really short video of this and I apologize the the it's very it's not the best uh clarity it's kind of blurry but it is pretty crazy to me at least to see a dog herding cattle. Oops. Let's try that again. Sorry. I think I, oh I hit replay. Here we go. All right. And then next I have um, just a short uh, video that looks at that that floppy ear part I was talking about earlier um, and why domesticated animals tend to have floppy ears. Here's a strange thing. Wolves and coyotes have these big upright ears, all the better to hear you with. But my dog Zeke here has floppy ears. Why the difference? Doesn't he need to hear too? Charles Darwin himself actually thought a lot about this question. 150 years ago, he published a book that said, look, it's not just pet dogs. Pigs have floppier ears than wild boars. Farmed goats have floppier ears than wild goats. There are floppy-eared rabbits, cows, and sheep. And that's not the only weird thing. Tame animals tend to have shorter snouts, and their fur tends to be paler or have patches with color missing. All these mysterious traits put together have been called domestication syndrome. So, what's going on here? The story starts thousands and thousands of years ago when humans were surrounded by animals. Some animals were scary, and some were a bit more approachable, even potentially useful. Our ancestors wanted them to be tamer, so sometimes they tried breeding the friendliest ones. And at some point, strange side effects started to show up. Thousands of years later, good old Darwin noticed the domestication syndrome pattern, but all he'd learned about change in the animal kingdom couldn't explain this connection between behavior and appearance. Scientists who came after him couldn't figure it out either. But for the past few years, scientists have been throwing around a fascinating hypothesis. They think the answer to this whole puzzle lies in a special group of cells. They're called neural crest cells. And coincidentally, they were discovered by Wilhelm Hiss the exact same year Darwin published his book. Neural crest cells show up very early in the development of all vertebrate embryos. As the embryo grows into a goat or a pig or a wolf, these special cells travel to every corner of the body and take on all sorts of different jobs. Now here's the thing. Some of these cells end up right here above the kidneys. They become cells that secrete adrenaline, that famous fight or flight hormone. Wild animals are always fighting or fleeing to survive, and that makes it hard for humans to get close. But what if an animal was born with fewer of these neural crest cells, or those cells didn't work so well? That animal would have less adrenaline. It would probably be less freaked out by humans, and it would pass that behavior on to its offspring. The idea is that this is what's going on in domesticated animals. Their neural crest cells have been dialed back. And this would explain all the appearance stuff too, because neural crest derived cells do a lot more than just make adrenaline. Some of the cells end up forming parts of the face. Some of them become cells that control the color of skin and hair. And some of them make their way into the ears and help make cartilage. It's likely this is how dogs first got floppy ears, and then centuries of intentional human breeding helped accentuate or reverse that change. But the neural crest cell hypothesis doesn't quite explain every bit of domestication syndrome, like what's going on with other tame species that do have upright ears. This might be the excuse scientists need to spend more time with their pets. This is Skunk Bear, NPR's science show. Please subscribe and check out some papers about the so to me, that's just that's just so cool. Um, this whole idea that there's a, a whole set of genes that are linked to 
domestication. Um, and then we'll end because it's David Attenborough. We'll end with uh, one last uh, video. About if animals are to work in a team, they need to be able to communicate with one another. And sometimes it's possible for you to communicate with them. Wolves howl to warn neighboring packs to keep their distance, but they also do so to reunite their own pack if it's got scattered after a long hunt. And as they assemble again, they visibly delight in one another's company. This pack too, like that of African hunting dogs, is ruled by an alpha pair who are the only ones to breed. But there's also a strict hierarchy among the other members, one for males and one for females. This is reinforced daily by mouth licking, crawling and mounting. These rituals become particularly intense just before the pack leaves on a hunt. It's a bonding session that reminds each hunter of its place in the team. Invaluable in the struggle to come. And off they go. Those distant dots are their targets. Elk, the North American equivalent of the European red deer. Snow drifts will make the chase difficult. The wolf's pads are particularly broad, but in really deep snow, the elk's long legs give them the advantage. And in such country as this, there's little chance of taking them by surprise. So the chase is likely to be a long and exhausting one. One of the stags is flagging, and the pack have managed to separate it from the main herd. Another sprints past close by and confuses things. Most of the wolves stick to their original quarry. They have, after all, been harrying it for some time, and it may be tiring. But it's got away. Another wolf is chasing the stag that ran by them earlier. But that escapes too. Only one in ten wolf hunts is successful. <laughs> 